I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. Before I actually introduce you guys, I want to say that the producer of the show came in here and we were just having a general conversation about television and the producer of the show said, oh, and Showtime's about to have this amazing show come on with Paul Giamatti. And then you said, Brian Koppelman, you said, you're fucking around with us, right? And he said, no, why? Because you and David Levine, who's also here, uh, said, because we're the showrunners and writers of the show. So Brian Koppelman and David Levine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great so, to be here. Yeah, man. Great to be here. I just keep I, every time I'm on. I I know. What is it? Tucker Max is is who I'm competing with for being. No, on. now you're. Now I think you're the winner. I've I, won. I, yeah, you've been on the podcast I, more than anyone else. I, yeah, I'm the. I have been on most frequent guest. Yeah, the mo- I am the most frequent guest on the across the James uh, Altucher. Uh, podcast platform. That's yes. amazing. Well, yes. that's the only category you could beat Tucker in, as far as numbers. <laughs> I, I think, think. That that's true. <laughs> I think Tucker's number two, but I'm I'm now clear the clear one. Yeah, so the winner. I'm thrilled. So so just because you've been on a bunch of times and you've been on, uh, just but I'll lay the background again. You guys did my several of my all time favorite movies: Rounders, A uh, Solitary Man. Um, now I've seen the Girlfriend Experience, which. You, you also were actually starring in, David, you know, in a little way. Yeah, I did get pulled into <laughs> yes. being on screen in that one. And uh, uh, oh, uh, did I say Ocean's 13? Uh, Rounders, uh, which we talked about plenty of times. And now you're doing this, the upcoming show on Showtime, Billions. We'll describe that in a second. But what got you started? Uh, I mean, I know you've done some TV stuff before that hasn't really worked out. Like, what made you decide to go from movies to TV here? Like, and was this like... I mean, because that takes a, I would imagine that whole development time is much longer and scarier than movies, even though that itself seems an impossible. Wait, no, you got to, you have it completely, you got it back. All right, teach <laughs> so me. that's great. Teach you have me. it backwards, Dave. <laughs> we, uh, well, as far as the development time, yeah. I mean, this thing happened incredibly quickly. Well, slow and quick, right? We started working on the script uh, about two years ago. And then this time last year, we hadn't even shot the pilot yet. So we shot the entire thing. No, in I know. 2015. I, was, I was on the but set also there, when you yeah, were shooting you were, the pilot. You did yeah. come to the set, uh, and we don't have to get into the specifics, but you were great. You're the best set visitor we ever had. You were, uh, 
you were interested, engaged, you stayed out of the way, you didn't bother the actors, you told us jokes when we were sort of like having a tense moment, and you also, I found out later, having a really bad business life day, and you like just- Like the worst in years. <laughs> right, like your worst, bi- and, yet, and yet you were smiley and encouraging, it was great, you were kind of doing all the stuff that you would tell people to do, like you didn't get lost in your own world, you were, you were helpful, you didn't make it all about you, you were really fun to have you on set. Well, because this was like one of the, I knew this was gonna be one of the best days of the year for me, so I wasn't gonna let the worst aspect of it like <laughs> take control, because then what a disappointment that would be. Great so, perspective. You know, but I wanna point out, like, and then I wanna continue with your answer, but just being on the set was amazing to me because I'd never been on the set of a TV show being shot, and the director you had for the pilot, who directed uh, Limitless, which is one of my favorite movies, he directed Divergent also, but I, I was really trying to figure out what he was doing. He was shooting like every scene like so many times. And I remember the scene with the car pulling out and another car coming in. Do you remember that scene? Mm-hmm. Um, sure. So, so he kept doing it over and over. And it was like, can you make the car like start a quarter second faster? And it was that whole thing where I finally realized what he's doing is he's trying to show in this very subtle way that these guys are risk takers. That's being in the, and he's showing it with every shot how they're risk takers. So here's this like very expensive, fancy car pulling out at just the right second so it narrowly misses another car pulling in. And that's just a small example of the kind of risks that could happen throughout the whole next 12 episodes. So I just thought it was fast. And then also when he was shooting like the wide shots of Damian Lewis, like again, showing the expanse of, you know, a hedge fund manager and, and the domain they rule. And I just thought it was very interesting to me to see all of the decisions he was making while shooting. Uh, and I know you guys were involved in a lot of that decision making as well. Well, yeah, it's an insightful look at it. That's what you try to do when, when uh, you're making a show or a movie. You want to try to communicate the themes in sort of every way, in small ways, like like you're saying about a car pulling out all the way through the way the actors perform it. One of the biggest parts of our job, and it's not something I think people understand uh, or showrunners talk about that often, but one of the most important things we do is hire the director for each episode. And so, because when you do that, you are seeding many creative decisions, micro creative decisions to that individual and the to the extent that they have the capacity to really understand your themes the mission of the show who the characters are they're really good directors this woman who directed episode 10 of our show her name is karen kusama or neil labute who directed the fifth episode oh my god neil labute directed an episode it was one of my favorite directors well you'll freak when you see the episode that's episode five there's got to be a lot of relationship stuff in that episode right yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. He's fan. He's um. He's everything you'd hope he'd be. And uh, but the these directors when they're when the, they're sort of um, and when they intersect with the material at a place that is at like the the heart of who they are uh, creatively, they add stuff that we could never imagine. So yeah, all those things you're talking about, we've had conversations with them about how they're going to shoot that stuff. But then we're counting on their creative inspiration to be additive, to uh, somehow understand what the show is supposed to do on a thematic level and that they're going to going to somehow elevate our stories as opposed to just putting the camera somewhere and capturing the story. Well, well, it made me realize, and this is what I always like about the best writing too, that it's not just the story but how – the, how the language is used, whether it's minimalist or maximalist and so on, should be part, the, 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 the context of the language should almost be part of the story. And in this case, the way information is presented is not just in the script, but in also all this visual stuff that's demonstrated, mean, there's all these decisions about it. And I think just seeing that from the pilot, and I'm assuming you did it throughout, it's, it was just incredible. And that's what you see in the trailer too. When I say, whenever I see the, tra- watch the trailer like maybe fifty times now. So, uh, it's yeah, just... there's many versions of it now too. So, yeah, the trailer evolves little by little as the um, trailer cutters at the network get more material from each new episode. Oh, okay. Um, so the first trailer had only stuff from the pilot, but by the time they got to the place where it was sort of the official trailer, I think they were pulling from like five or maybe six. Yeah. Episodes. So they've, they've continued yeah. to add new little, and that's been a fascinating part of the process for us to watch. We happen to be lucky enough that these people, cause now, you know, we've been doing some version of this for like 18 years and these people, you can feel it. They understand our show and they're, they're crafting materials to sell that accurately depicts the cool parts of our show, which is fun. Sometimes you'll see spots that people, you know, in past movies or things where you're just like, 
that doesn't look like the movie we made. Or Yeah, sometimes it doesn't look like uh, people took much care with it, but these people are very inspired to do, like, the personal job and, like, handle it with and, care. And just to back love. up to what David was saying about uh, um, your, your initial question, we didn't get into a development process here, which I've talked about in your podcast before, but I'll say it quickly in case anyone hasn't listened, because we wrote this script on spec, meaning we wrote it without a deal in place. Why did you do that? So that we would avoid... A development process so that mm. we would have a piece of material that someone could say i'm gonna buy this and make it mm. as opposed to i'm gonna buy um, i'm gonna buy a pitch an idea then you go write it and then you don't know if they're going to make it mm. they may decide not to by having a piece of material that we wrote we were able to have some leverage in negotiating with the networks to say if you want to buy this you have to commit to at least making the pilot now we didn't have enough leverage because we didn't have movies you know stars attached at that time to be TV stars, uh, you know, to say, okay, you have to make the whole season the way, say, True Detective had Woody Harrelson and Ma Matthew McConaughey. That package went out with a script and those actors. And so then they were able to say, you have to green light the whole season. Mm -hmm. But at least we were able to get them to say they'll green light the pilot once we cast it. And, and so that it, you did get a, a, a very, uh, the, the latest kind of star out of Showtime, Damian Lewis, who was obviously in Homeland, did they hook you up with Damian Lewis or did you? We did. I mean, we can get into that, you know, because, but let me go back to your first yes. question because, you yes, know. I got so many questions. I was, a, I was a little bit flipped by saying it all happened quickly because the last year went by in a blur and we did shoot all 12 episodes in the last year. But in many ways, this show is a huge culmination for us. Um, we've had certain areas of fascination um, for a long time, one of them being hedge funds in particular and one being the the nature of the position of the U.S. attorney and the kind of power that U.S. attorneys wield. Well, let me let me ask you this: How did you? Well, first describe for a second what the show is about. Just what's the overall pitch on the show? The uh, the show centers around um, a hedge fund billionaire named Bobby Axelrod Ax, and he's played by Damian Lewis, and. The U.S. attorney for the Southern District, Chuck Rhodes, who's played by Paul Giamatti, and these guys are sort of like kings in their own worlds, and then they come into conflict with each other and sort of cross swords. So they have to manage their own kingdoms while doing this battle with each other that's sort of akin to what we've seen play out over the last several years in the financial And so we wanted to gain, you know, like – uh, the enough knowledge to do something that was forensically accurate in each of these worlds and realistic, but but with heightened the, the possibility of heightened drama. And well, I think what you were going to get at, David, about it being a culmination is that for years and years and years we had been think, you know thinking about how to tell how these kinds of stories because billionaires we realized a long time ago are like nation states, <laughs> oligarchs, and American oligarchs in a way. And U.S. attorneys have the kind of powers that kings have. So even when we say kings, we're not just tossing it off. We've thought about the kind of uh, power, discretion, kings have to mete out justice. And U.S. attorneys are unique. They're not like district attorneys or even state's attorney generals. They have incredible discretion and um, amazingly powerful prosecutorial resources. And the people in, in who other end words, up, they can do stuff beyond what they should. Well, like king, they, <laughs> kings can say off with your head. That's right. And you're dead. Well, if you look at the if you look at the people who have been U.S. attorneys, or many of them, um, many of them use these positions, or whether they maybe that's too pejorative, but but they they serve in these positions, um, and then somehow become propelled into the national spotlight. Uh, and so we were. We've been trying to, for years, think about how that all works and why, why? and what makes why somebody you, like why that. Why were you so, why were you into that? I think that we've just had a long fascination with the nature of power. Um, and, you know, we've had an interest in the nature of wealth, certainly, and, and what um, makes a billionaire unique. That's a certain kind of power. And the U.S. attorneys, they wield a lot of financial resources. It's not in their pocket. They They get paid very modestly but they get this other reward of this great power. And in a way, these ambitions are somewhat similar in their scope, even though the, the specific nature puts them into conflict with each other. I would, use, I would have said a long time ago, and I think it is true somehow, that in our work very often, we end up talking about uh, men engaged in commerce 
women engaged in commerce too, American commerce. There's something about that kind of exchange that's so rooted in America, winning and losing in that way, that has long been interesting. I know. I mean, that, uh, that's obviously at the heart of rounders, just yeah. cards are the way it's played. Out. Yeah. Uh, no, the, I was thinking the, the same raw, thing. I the raw thing. That's your yeah. first. Movie. I mean, we love mm-hmm. Speed and the Plow Glenn, and Glenn, Ocean's 13. But mm-hmm. if, yeah, if you look at Speed the Plow and Glen Gary, Glen Ross and American Buffalo, um, if anyone thinks we wrote those, we, we didn't. That's, those were written by David Mamet. <laughs> good trying to take credit for <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, David Mamet. I was wondering. When, when, when we, we, did speed the plow, when we did Speed the Plow, and I remember Montana turning to me. No, but like those things just hit us in a very primal way. And so those were about sort of um, smaller worlds, but 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 the characters in them had, uh, you know, king-like desires. And so for us, the idea to actually give those desires to people with king-like powers was, and then put two of them in opposition to each other, was really compelling. And I'd say also, like about eight years ago or nine years ago, um, I got to spend a couple of weekends with a billionaire and... Right around that time, Dave, you were meeting a bunch of these people in Greenwich. But I, I got to spend time with one in a very, um, really way behind the curtain. Uh, and Why? Someone I knew knew this person. And so I ended up being at this person's house. Uh, and then Dave and I met many billionaires. So the show ends up based on many experiences from many of them. But I remember this idea of the nation state calling to you and we were talking about it. I was like, what the heck? And we, together we came up with this idea. They're, they're like nation states. They have, they have their own like flotillas, right? Armadas, m- m- military people. They well, have well, artist colonies in their way. Because this one person I knew, he like had artists who were his favorite artists. So he built on his huge grounds um, artist studios, but not for any reason other than then he could have the artists he liked around him. And it was just like, what is right, that? So what must create what, their world? What mm-hmm. must that feel like? Yes. What mm-hmm. must that feel like to be able to move with that kind of f- footprint? It's not just being like wealthy. It is a whole other kind of experience. And then when those people walk into a room, you see the look on the eyes of the people around them. Everybody wants something. You know, it's like when a beautiful, a really, really beautiful woman walks in a room, and you can just look around, and nobody. Everybody looks. Everybody wants something. And so we wondered, like, what the hell does that feel like? And how do you stay normal? And how do you not become corrupt? How do you not give in to whatever? You can have everything. And then you, we met a U.S. Uh, we met somebody who had been a U.S. attorney and was in another very similar prosecutorial position. And Dave asked the guy, why do you keep doing it when— Yeah, we, we were talking to this guy. He was an Ivy League-educated guy with a law degree. He'd had this long career. He'd been talking about loving golf but not being able to afford a country club membership because he only made $165,000 And he had something. been only because in that world, that's only. Yeah, and and that, he had been earning, he had been, in a, he'd been offered jobs for $2.5 million as a, because he, of the office he was leaving. You know, when you leave one of these offices, you can go get a huge seven-figure job. So we said, you know, why do you do what you do? And he, and he just said to us, and he knew that we were meeting him to, um, you know, as research and we were interviewing him basically. And he just said the power. Hmm. He said, I can train my sights on somebody and open a file and, you know, I can go after him. And it's really fun. And he said, I decide, he goes, I decide uh, what to go after. Cause we said, well, if you're engaged in um, going after people who commit uh, felonies in the world of business, how do you, there's so many. And he says, you know, I got to look at it and, Sometimes I have to say, look, business needs to function for America to function. So I can't go after everything. And sometimes I just let stuff slide when I think it doesn't quite get to the egregious. And I, then I looked at him and I went, wait, I remember this so clearly. You and I look at each other like, did the guy just say to us that he kind of lets a bunch of stuff slide? But then and I was like, how do, how do you pick? And it, it really was like this one person in this position of real power just said to us, I kind of, it's a gut call. You know, I decide. And and we thought that was kind of monstrous in a way. But it's interesting though because even I think you I think that exact thing happens in the first few minutes of your pilot, right? Where uh, I I don't want to give anything away. It's I think a little bit's in the trailer. It seems like the Paul Giamatti character needs a certain standard to be reached of you know many many pieces of evidence before he's going to make an active decision. But then he's all in. Right, and and a certain uh, value level on the target. Yeah, 
also helps. But then he won't back off. I'm guessing is the is the thing. Like once well, he's yeah, all in, because, he's all in emotionally as because well. Because once once they sort of make that commitment, then winning for them is just as important as it is for the business people to win. I mean, it becomes all about winning. Well, and I want to get to this too um, in a second, which is kind of the parallel, uh, which you've been referring to all along, but the parallel between the billionaire and the, and the, the DA. But again, I want to, I want to just really- U.S. attorney, which I only want to point out because DAs don't have nearly the power that United States oh, okay. attorneys have. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so I didn't know the difference. Um, yeah, federal versus state. Okay. U.S. attorney only reports the attorney general of the United States who reports the president. So they're, they're just, and they have federal powers, which means they can set aside a whole bunch of rules of, uh, normal rules of, of law. You know, they, they can set aside heresy rules, for instance. I mean, hearsay, hearsay. rules. Mm -hmm. And so, so, okay. So, so back to like, you're, you're starting to do the research. Uh, you, you meet a bunch of billionaires, you meet, uh, uh, the, the U S attorney. Um, you've, you've also uh, Andrew Roy Sorkin who wrote, um, too big the, to fail. the book too big to fail. Yes. Uh, he, he, you, you spoke to him. We had a meeting and yeah, we, we, um, became co-creators because he was interested in the same areas and we decided that we would all, you know, join together. We created create the, show the show with Andrew and uh, the pilot with Andrew and then Dave and I are, are, and we're all executive producers of the show and, but Dave and I are the showrunners and make the show on an ongoing uh, basis. But I think part of it, 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 James is, you know, David and I have been best friends since we were little kids and have always like sort of believed in the possibility that you could have like loyalty and honor and still have ambition and that you can sort of balance these things. And as, as writers, as artists, we find ourselves drawn to people put to the, that kind of question. You know, all, I think it's somewhere in all of our work. It's like when you know what the right thing to do is, but you don't do it, why? What does that mean? What kind of temptations are okay to give into? What kind of temptations aren't? How do you make amends for that kind of thing? To whom are you accountable? And this area presented to us so many avenues down which we could explore those things. Yeah, in, no, a, it's, in a way that most things don't. Don't you is, think? Yeah, and coincidentally, um, really about the same time we started getting interested, uh, especially in the hedge fund world, we also found our interest really drawn to this premium cable these, you know, 12 episode seasonal dramas, they started to become our favorite things in entertainment. I mean, every year has some great movies and we're huge fans of, of the movies still, but we found the thing that we were drawn to and talking about a lot was like the Sopranos and Mad Men and discussing it and the way that it like lives in your imagination and the detail and the depths that you can get into with the characters when it's 12 hours and then 24 and, and on and on as the seasons go. And all this great stuff was happening in TV with this amazing freedom to roam and go deep. Um, it just seemed like series TV was the the place to tell the story. And did you feel confident that even if um, Showtime or whoever didn't pick it up, that you would there would somebody would pick it up? Like now, there's so many places doing original programming, even like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu. Like they're all starting. I mean, to certainly it seemed like there were a lot of outlets, but we don't really sit back and calculate. Um, the, the outcome, um, certainly when things are working best, we think to ourselves, okay, we have a fascination here. It sets up to be a great TV show. Let's keep the reins in our hands and write this thing. We'll put in the sweat equity. We'll risk the time and effort. If nobody wants to make it our way, they have the right to say no. We're going to walk away and then we're going to have to spend however long it takes to come up with the next thing. It was just risk. And, and we when Dave, yeah, when Dave it. talks about the, the creative, the sweat equity or the sort of time, it's important, I think, for because, you know, uh, and people engage in anything, uh, it's a valid question you ask, like, did we think about where it could go? Probably at the very beginning when you have an idea, by having done this so long, maybe part of the process of selecting an idea that you that isn't even conscious is like, oh, this feels like something that that could work. Mm -hmm. But once you sort of pass that little threshold, then it's all about, I remember writing this and I remember, you know, we'd show up every day and we weren't getting paid to do it. And we, we didn't take another job in Hollywood during this time. And it was the uh, fall of, fall into winter of 2013. And it was cold and I would walk through the park and Dave would walk from the subway. And I just remember that it felt 
like we were really engaged in something important and right to be doing for ourselves. We would we would do that. We outlined this thing. We talked to Andrew Sorkin a lot in the beginning um, in terms of the world, like, and we would go and have these dinners with people. And we never would have these dinners, and with people, I mean, with hedge fund billionaires and with people who were on the judicial prosecutorial side. I don't know. There was no um, no sense in our minds that we were maybe doing this. We knew we were doing, we were all the fuck in. Like we were committed in a way that didn't really allow for the scenario you're talking about of some other suit, some other way or it not happening. Like we would go sit with these Titans and they would tell us stories and we would look at each other and know like, okay, we're going to deploy that. That's going to happen. Would you That'll happen in each dinner. Yeah. Like, well, our technique generally is like, um, I gab at these people a lot and Dave makes sure that he gets it all down we, if we I don't. take notes with people and they, they don't mind. Okay. But, you know, the people who are sitting down with you, they're not under any illusion that they're not revealing something. We're not tricking them into saying it. And generally, they just want it to be done accurately. So, so if somebody's so, going to jot down a few things, they'd probably prefer that to then somebody right. making it well, up. Well, you're excellent at this, later. though. You're excellent at it. Because really, it is. I'm, I tend to interview. You know, I'm good at interviewing. And we'll decide ahead of time what we're going to do. And, I mean, you'll talk to an interview. But I'll do most of the, like um, – initial sort of getting them comfortable asking questions and just early on at a certain point dave will just be like like a reporter in a, an old movie he'll just like kind of nod like and gesture a little bit to the notebook and they'll barely look at the kind of nod and then the little notebook comes down and i'll see his in david's instincts for this stuff's incredible i mean he just knows exactly what we can't forget and then he'll look at me and i'll know oh i should ask more about that or i should ask more about this or that's really interesting it's a great one of the ways that when we're, we never we've never talked about this but like one of the ways i think figure out what avenues to go down is I can tell when you start getting fired up and writing a bunch of stuff down. What's I'm an like, example oh. in one of these dinners where oh, that so, happened? I mean... Just one one example or two examples. Like, particularly well, with a billionaire, because I'm curious. Early, early on so in this, when we, when we realized that we wanted to deal with a, a character who was really impactful on Wall Street and who wasn't, like, 25 years old, a guy who was of a certain age, there's a couple things that those guys have gone through that were big formative events, one being um, the financial crisis and the other being 9-11. And we knew that we wanted our character to have had like a really important experience with 9-11. And we um, ended up meeting with somebody who had one of those kind of experiences. And, and when he started talking about that, you know, we started taking notes. Hmm. But there are, but there are little things too that people reveal just about how they think about the world. So the way somebody we're sitting with might order wine, it may not show up exactly in the way the character orders wine in the show. It might be the way the character orders a yacht. Mm -hmm. But the way that he thinks that kind of thing through and thinks about its impact or doesn't think about its impact on other people, the way it reveals in general how he considers his place uh, versus your place. So you're you're looking not for the exact specifics. You're looking for something that's like one notch deeper than that. So describe, the universal des- thing in it. Describe that though, like so the wine or the yacht thing. How do they view? Well, yeah, yeah I like mean, me? we're at dinner with a billionaire, and it's clear that um, he's doing us the favor by sitting with us. So we are going. How is to, that clear? Um, because we're in it. He doesn't. He, you know, he has a lot of things he could be doing. We asked the favor right. to spend the time. But also, he's flattered. You asked, so sure uh, he shows they get up. A, but... They got a lot of flattery okay. opportunities in life. But sure, you know, he was somewhat intrigued, I suppose, at the prospect. But it was very speculative at that point. Um, and you know, so we sort of, I don't know, it was sort of uh, right, I'll understood say, he, that we were going, we were right. going to pay. Um, but when he ordered the wine, Wait, he up. said to the major d, he changed the restaurant that, to where he always I want you goes. to say that. First, he said we should pick the restaurant. He, we picked our restaurant, you know, a top-notch restaurant. Suddenly, five minutes before the dinner, it changed the place he always goes, which is a much more expensive Incredibly restaurant. fancy right. restaurant. And then when it was time to order the wine, he said to the guy, just bring me what I always have. And there were four of us, and we drank it, and it was unbelievable. Second bottle. And then, of course, you know— if you're thirsty for even a sip more, he just stuck his finger in the air and the second bottle appeared and then the check came and, you know, it was like more than any human could put on any kind of expense account. I mean, thousands of dollars. Was, and we don't have an expense account at that point. And, you know, us. like this is a guy who's smart enough to not do anything by accident. It was, it was hilarious to us. But, you know, we were like, 
it, we were just aghast at the cost of it. It was, and you know, because at this time we we're doing this speculatively. We're not hired by some studio. We don't have an expense account. And I would say, I'm, I was aware when I first started making a really good living, I would be so aware, you know, when I even was in my 20s and I was ahead of most of my friends, just luckily, you know, I was making six figures when they were making $20,000. I mean, you can attest to the fact, I would buy everybody every dinner all the time because I was like, oh, I'm so lucky. Like, what luck I have. I'm buying burgers for everybody is easy for me. And I could see on their face, it'd be a little bit of a drag. So at any kind of exchange, so, I mean, it was clear, you know, I would never spend $2,000 on dinner. Like, I just wouldn't do it. But, and then you also have the prospect of, you have 20 more billionaires to interview, like... Yeah. Well, but, yeah. I mean, there was clearly, like, a power dynamic going on there. Like, he was um, willing to or, tell or us did some he not stuff. think? No, he had to be... No. He, these no guys, way. even when they act like they're not thinking, I mean, they don't just accidentally stumble along and amass these fortunes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he was he was showing us that... He was doing us the favor and, you know, we were nice enough to pay, but that he was no sucker and that we were. Hmm. Hmm. That's funny. So that was interesting just in terms of how each exchange or often for many of these people, each exchange has a winner and a loser in a way that most of us don't think about a dinner that way. And did you? I had never thought about a dinner and all the dinners I've had. And I've had many dinners. <laughs> right. I've never thought about, oh, who's going to win the dinner? See, he couldn't live with the idea that we won the dinner by going away with information. So he had to win too. He by hurting us with a dinner check, the price of a trip to Florida. So, you know? so, and then, so, so then you take that away with you and it gives you just, by the way, so let's, that's one little thing we learned. And then you measure that against the next 20 of these people that you talk to and how, and so you measure that against, well, wait, the person also does a tremendous amount of charity. Okay. What is this information? How does this information color that? How does that charity information color the first thing? And because you're trying, if you're trying to do this not only accurately, but um, in a way that has some larger meaning or purpose, you're constantly trying to add these things all together so that you can write unconsciously without thinking about any of it. You think about all this for a long time before you start writing scenes. So, 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 that, so that now when I'm writing scenes and Dave's writing scenes, one of us might look at the other and be like, oh, I don't know if Axe would say that or do that. But we don't ever talk about, oh, because the specifics of like this person that you, you end up internalizing by spending enough time and talking about enough, you kind of internalize the characteristics and then make a fictional character who embodies the most interesting parts of all of it and hopefully a unified part of all of it. I kind of think that? this is unique to you guys in some sense. I mean, I haven't spoken to a lot of writers of shows, but uh, this reminds me of when we talked about rounders and how you guys started doing that you spoke for like a year you know going to the club going that we always clubs, used to go yeah. to uh and and you spoke for about a year or so before you started writing words down and did you did the same process happen here like you just did a ton of research it was kind of similar because the uh it was the nights out mm -hmm. it was night after night being out and doing this and it not feeling like work but feeling like really important and fascinating um, it was very similar to when we were hooked into the rounders mission and going to the clubs. Did you ever feel like when having dinner with and doing these, this research on these billionaires that they, the opposite of what, of the dinner you just, you just described, like someone trying to relate more to you and kind of the win fake, you the over. The fake humble approach? Not even fake. Like, cause everything right now sort of has been a little bit negative, but has there anybody who's been like maybe successful because of their ability to totally relate with you? Oh yeah. I mean, don't, don't take it like, um we found something about that off-putting. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, a charisma at play that you love all of them. Mm -hmm. You think to yourself, you know, well, this guy, you know, this vibe has got to be the her the heroic element of the show. Mm -hmm. And then when you go away and the spell wears off, you sort of like gather your faculties and go, oh, wait, I was just like totally handled and manipulated. And, you know, I was made to love that person. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are, there are absolutely... A couple of the people we sat with, it was clear that they w had convinced themselves and they meant it, that their mission was greater than themselves, that they were doing it to serve other people in their minds, not just family members either, that they were trying, that they felt it was like they were put on this earth to do this thing better than anybody else. That's always really compelling, right, for drama or anything. When you meet somebody and you know that they're aligned for the right reasons, mm -hmm. it's fascinating. 
and and we don't judge good or bad, good or bad, really. Like when that whole thing I said about the, the they have to win. Well, okay, so you can stop and say that's negative, or you can stop and say, what makes somebody that way? Hmm. What were the formative experiences? Where was that person broken? How? Why was this the way this person compensated instead of drugs and alcohol? Why did or you know how? Did those things, what good is this attitude done? So you try to do a real 360 degree look at it. You try not to be reductive. You try to really be additive, cumulative, and put put the whole thing together. To us, both of these characters and the other characters in the show have heroic aspects, as David was saying. And we're fascinated by the character Damian Lewis, but we do not think of him as a bad guy. Because when you sit with the U.S. attorneys, like as Dave said, the one who said the thing about power to us, I could. we are equally fascinated by why they have to say, uh, I've won 80 times and I've never lost. And, uh, I, you know, why they've chosen to be able to say, I'm denying myself the money because I'm, and you, you hear behind all of it is, you know, I should be governor. I should be president. I know more. I'm smarter. I'm better. And we're, so those things are really interesting to, 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 watch and view and try to then figure out how to put in a dramatic construct. And so I think, and what happens in the show, I imagine, is, um, you know, obviously there's no hero or villain, right? So you have this U.S. attorney with power and you have this billionaire with money. And like you say, they have these formative experiences that bring them to this this sort of tension. And there's a law in the middle that allow, it's almost like this platform that allows them to mediate their, their psychological problems. And that's what the show becomes about. So, so... Which leads to the other question, which is, you know, kind of Main Street versus Wall Street. So essentially this show is like Main Street versus Wall Street. At first you kind of think everyone's going to be hoping for the U.S. attorney to quote unquote win and the other guy to lose, you know, acts to lose. But it, it becomes more complicated, right? Well, yeah, we... We never set out to do like Main Street versus Wall Street. Yeah, I don't think that, that's in the show at all. Actually. But but I think that's if you just hear the premise of the show, that's what I I feel is that I, I guess uh, you know if you talked about uh, <coughs> uh, a hedge fund guy who was being pursued by a U.S. attorney and the guy was a billionaire and the U.S. attorney was devoutly going after him, I guess uh, the majority of people would think, oh, you know, I'm for the law and order guy, but. Our part of our goal was to get underneath that and to really make people sort of get sucked into this in a way that they found their rooting interests changing and growing and right. evolving in a lot of different ways. I think that's how you, you you make something that is allowed to survive 24, 36, 48 episodes. You have to keep the story going by throwing more. We want you to root. We, we you know, Tarantino says that thing about audiences being so sophisticated that if you uh, use the metaphor of uh, a roller coaster for watching the entertainment. They're leaning into the turn before the turn. So he wants to get them leaning left, and then boom, the roller coaster goes right. That's why Space Mountain is so great, because mm -hmm. you can't see which way to lean. And so we have found that when people watch the, a few of these episodes, they begin leaning in a certain direction they didn't necessarily expect themselves to. And then we try to, and then they sl head snaps back the other way. And that's, as dramatists, that's what you're hoping to do, is is engage people in a way that they find themselves switching loyalties, switching allegiance, and then having to afterwards, the way we would walk away from these dinners, and have to kind of shake our heads off like a cartoon character, a cartoon dog or something, and then go like, wait, what What just happened? Or what did they say? Or we just, you know, that's what you hope the audience goes through as well. And there are characters in the show who uh, go through a similar arc. But, you know, uh, so I, I, in one of the um, three-second scenes in the trailer, uh, I guess it's Paul Giamatti's wife is talking to a hedge fund trader who just made seven point two million on on the year, and um, and he's feeling bad about himself, is my assumption, because she's like a therapist of some sort or trainer or whatever. Um, what you know? How are people going to? How do, that seems like very subtle to try to get people to lean towards, uh, you know, having any sympathy towards the guy who just made seven point two million on the year. Like, how do you kind of play with that in the writing? Like, how did you write that scene? I don't know. You know, we didn't think of that. We just thought, like, these guys work here. These are the kind of numbers they deal in. But, like, um, but it's so easy to make that black and white. Or They're not. I'll them. just say, we don't know. It's easy to, look, you can view the world as a Manichaean uh, construct or not. Mm -hmm. We don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. 
So, but, but I think it's again, but, it's hard to. I think it's the extra challenge of being a good writer to kind of make it that way, not you know, black and white. Well, yeah, but w- w- I don't. I don't know if you draw people as they are, not as like uh, some two dimensional version of what it, it, reductive version of, of of what they are. I mean, it's by by seeing why, by hearing why. Look, some people will just go. Ah, I don't want to see a thing about rich people. Okay, that's fine. But but look, rich people have so much influence. We're we're fascinated by why uh, these why Americans um, fall in love with as long as you're super charismatic, um, confident, very wealthy. Most Americans will like give you a break and want to wear a T-shirt with your picture on it. And so, why is that? Yeah, look at uh, Donald Trump uh, in the polls. Donald Trump, but look at Mark Cuban, who I like. I yeah. know Mark, and I like him a great deal. But he's a superhero to people. Right. And w- w- and they relate to him somehow. There's an aspirational piece of who we are that's hardwired in Americans somehow. I don't know. We're really interested in that. Why? I, like, I, I know Mark's a good guy. Um, but why do we put, you know, why is it, I mean, you mentioned Marcus Lemonis before. Like, what is it about these kind of people who that, that we are? Like you would think Marcus Lamon is a guy who takes over businesses, buys them cheap, um, fires sometimes half them the people, yeah. tells yeah. them what you would think. Now, again, you know, I have tremendous personal warmth for Marcus, and I think he's great. Um, you know, from the outside, that sounds like the bad guy, the bit, the big right. box bad guy. But then you watch the show, and he's he's um you know crying with them and trying to change their lives, yeah, and, and make money. And he becomes a yeah, and yeah. he becomes the good guy. Yeah. So if you can do that on a reality show, why? Absolutely, we feel like you can do some version of that. But and what we're really interested in is why we all get hypnotized in a way by certain of these people and then become surprised when they act like what they are. Right. And so if the show can do that a little bit, we'll if we'll feel and on both sides too. So, because you can look at the guys who've been um in these high pr- prosecutorial positions, whether it's Christie or Cuomo or Spitzer, and we you know, you have to go back and look at the things they said when they were in those offices about, oh, I'll never run for office or I don't care about anything but justice. And it forces you to ask yourself, well, what did they really care about if what they did right afterwards was run for office. cash in on it, <laughs> right. you know? So, so okay, so when you were actually writing this, though, I, I always think, like, so, so you've written novels, David, like, and that's a very solitary process. What is it about TV or even movies where everybody seems to, like, partner up and write, like, how did you how did you kind of write together on this? I, I mean, you can do that. Some people do it alone, but the way we've always done it, I you know, it's a collaborative medium and we just start right at the beginning when we're creating the stuff and there's a lot of dialogue and there's a lot of different voices and we're both deploying those things, you know, sometimes we are finding like this unified voice to write the same character and sometimes an, another character's coming in and it's more one of us, you know, and it just, it's something we've been able to do and it works really well. And, us. you know, you constantly have to um, keep pushing the envelope so that uh, uh, no scene is cliche, you know, and I think that's, there's so many cliches. Okay, attorney going after a hedge fund manager for insider trading. That's kind of like the book's been written. We know the whole cliche from beginning to end. Yeah, although but, that, that has never been on television before. <laughs> right, you know, like, right. That's actually, so, that's not, but, but I remember, just, for whatever that's worth. That's, I remember discussing with you, though, yeah. different, like, plot lines, and it was like an effort because you had to, like, it was so easy to fall into cliche, and... Oh, well, you, yeah, you pitched me a whole bunch of them, and I was yeah. like, we can't do that for this reason, or that's been done, or we've tried that one, yes. <laughs> but I had to true. really think hard, though, to find the things that maybe weren't cliche. Like, I had, and I know the whole industry, so I yes. had to, like, really... My brain was sweating trying to push past what you might have been. But thinking. it was satisfying when you sent that big list of really good ideas, and we had done like four of them. Right. And the one where you had really like thought through how it would happen, and we'd like sh- gone down some of those roads. I was like, we felt good about it that it had had passed that test. I mean, you know, there's there's been a series, a long series of stories of people getting prosecuted in the press over the past ten years, right? right. And particularly the past like 10, 15 years, you know, starting with like Enron yeah. and then oh, yeah. got into the hedge funds. And these stories it. do work out in a way that becomes familiar. So it's not good enough to just, you want to get a, a flavor of the reality so that people understand, oh, this is like all those stories I read, but it can't just work out just like all the stories they've read because then 
they know but, it. But and the, can I say the, the deeper sort of like if I go a notch further in what your question is about, you're really asking about collaboration, collaboration and and insights into creativity. Right, you, you push that. Yeah, so it's hard. So we look. It, it it can be hard. We decided from the beginning that we would do our best to each set our egos aside, and we each have strong egos, but that we would try to set it aside when we're doing the work. Again, it, and, and that we would each be rigorous to ourselves. We would apply tremendous rigor all the time. Dave came by that rigor very honestly and easily, harder for me in the beginning, but... Um, what, why harder for you in the beginning? You, you, because I couldn't... Um, uh, because I'd had other kinds of success... And I didn't understand the kind of rigor it took to like, I learned how to do this from David teaching me how to do it really. Like what's an example where ago. he came up with an idea and you were like, okay, you got to push it one step further. Well, that happens to both of us all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think he's just referring to like the nature of, especially in the beginning of your career, needing to write every day and work on it when it's not fun and when you're not inspired and you don't have a muse and it all seems like uh you know, delightful. There's all these other days when it just seems like a pain in the ass. I have a really specific it. thing that you taught. I mean, you a really foundational thing. We were writing rounders and we were at the end of it and we had made this deal that we were going to write two hours a day and we never broke it. We showed up every day and wrote the two hours. We never missed a day. And, um, and we would stop at the end of two hours and then, which we kind of had to because we each had jobs and things we had to get to. But also David said early on, like you kind of get fried at a certain point and so you should stop but we were gaining momentum. We were coming to writing the last scene, and it was really hard. Not the very last scene on the steps with Gretchen Maul, but the big poker scene, like the big end of the movie, the dramatic end. And it was very hard to write it, very difficult. And I remember my head just really hurt, and I was really gassed. And we're sitting in your old apartment, not in the slop sink room. We were, were the basement. We were at your house for some reason. Mm. And I remember looking at you and being like, dude, man, we got to stop. And you were like, no. This is the this is the moment you press through. Like we are on the precipice of it. We are not walking out of this room until we've written to the end. And you're gonna not go to work today, and I'm gonna whatever. And we're gonna and like uh, pushing past comfort to solve these problems. That which that idea that you could do that as a writer, I didn't understand. I thought, well, I'm I'm gassed. I'm at the end of it. And Dave was like, no, no, no. We actually are not. If we, it's what Seth Godin talks about in, in the dip. But it was really uh, years before that. And um, I remember coming out of there and leaving. We got to the end. And I remember just feeling drained in a way that I never had creatively before. And, you know, when you go through something like that and then it works, it, you, it, you start to re-hard. You, you start to kind of rewire yourself to know how to, how to do that. And wh where do you feel in billions now you had to push through those points while, while writing? <laughs> Every day. I mean, constantly. The entire year, basically. Yeah? Because yeah. there's so much in, a, in writing a TV. Yeah, you're right. You a wrote a Oh, no, now we give up. Now yeah. we give up. But you yeah. wrote like 12 mini movies, essentially. Yeah. There's just so much material. And I mean, every day you feel like the way he described, like you just have a huge headache. And you, and you have to like push through that. You left it all on the table and you have nothing left and you just got to go back the next day and just keep going. But now there is something great about it. I'll say like, so it's hard and we're miserable. We'll curse all the time <laughs> to each other about the hell of it. But there was a day writing one of the episodes where, um, for a, a certain reason, we had like a basically 36 hours where we had to rewrite most of a whole episode that another writer had had, had written. And um, we leave whoever, whatever writer starts the episode, then we leave their name on it, even if we end up writing most of it. And so we sat at desks across from one another. We split up the scenes. And it was, while we were doing it, it was kind of miserable. And because we'd spent, it was 14 or 15 hours in a row of just sitting there with like your foot up on, you know, my feet were up on my desk, Dave's on his, I think you were might, maybe you were writing on a desktop and I was running on a laptop computer. And uh, at the end of which we would pass scenes back and forth and one of us got stuck. Like I remember I would lean back and go, dude, I can't find this line in this spot. We go think, but at the end of it, I remember turning to you and, and we finished it and we knew it worked. And I remember turning to you and being, and, and we were both like, that was awful. It was hell. And then it was a beat, and I remember turning to you and being like, dude, it was also, that was, like, so much fun. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Because, like, we were right back in the basement where we wrote Rounders, um, in a way, and pushing through and trying our hardest to get the thing to be great. And, like, there is something, if you do this, those moments when 
it, you're, you're banging your head against it, but then suddenly you'll get a half hour where you feel like you're flying, like the thing just makes sense and the words are coming and all the research, like the nights of dinner and the notes that we take and the conversations and the, you know, uh, um, walking around the block, banging your head because you, you can't solve it. And then when it starts to actually work and fly, it's kind of magical, man. It's kind of transcendent. And so if you know those things are out there, it, it's, you, you can't fake it. You, you can't tell yourself you've, you've reached it. So the cliche, the answer of how do you avoid those cliches is you kind of know you have to have some moments that feel like that, that are really true. And then you measure the other stuff against it, I think. Well, so, so getting into the kind of um, sort of fundamental issues of the show. I mean, basically, uh, the the U.S. attorney is going after acts for insider trading. And so how did your opinions on basically capitalist crime, like this is sort of a very capitalist kind of crime. So a guy has more information about something than others. So the the um, theory is, is that the others are being taken advantage of somehow because somebody has more information than them. And so then- uh, uh, As you know, it's not always inside. I just want to say, I don't really want to give that stuff up because as as you know, there are many other ways that one could go after a hedge fund manager. It's not just insider information. No, in fact, it often has to be like you have to have a whole web close in, right, in order be, to get them for one thing. Because there's also yeah, there's just many right activist inv- yeah activist investors open themselves up for other reasons, right? right. But there's there are many kinds of actions I, for just for whatever it's worth. But I think what you're for. asking beyond the specifics of like whatever law is being potentially broken or whatever uh, infractions being pursued. One thing I think, if I think back to the beginning of this, I think I would have imagined that the guy who was stepping over the line knew it and was hoping he wouldn't get caught and knew he was doing bad and that the guy coming after him was in the right and was just hoping that he could get the proof to close it down. But actually, if once you get really into the middle of all this stuff, you realize that like a lot of these laws and statutes are pretty fucking arbitrary. And, right, like, there's a huge gray area. They come and go and politics are, are what cause a law to be put on the books, the politics of the day. And it wasn't the way it used to be, so things change. And the guys who are doing it, they certainly would may have an understanding of where those laws stand, but they have a sense of right and wrong that's not so sort of, um, you know, sullied by like the rules of the day they have a code and they believe yes. that they're living um in a capitalist system that's their right and they believe the government is the conspiracy and they're conspiring to use all the laws and statutes to close them down and the other guys think you know the prosecutors think that the hedge fund guys are greedy and trying to loophole and they hate each other but neither one but they both think they're the hero in the story. That right, was the fascinating part for me to learn getting in there. Well, it, it's interesting because there's so many gray areas, particularly in, in in kind of securities law. Like, so take inside information and take theories about capitalism. It actually is, you know, from on many viewpoints, good for a market to have as much information as possible in the market. So the only way inside information gets into the market is if somebody trades on that inside information. Right. So, so, and that's... You know, according to let's say a Milton Friedman type, that's actually good for the market and good for capitalism. So there could even well, be the efficient. Some... I mean, right? Because efficient mar efficient market theory, right? Which, um, you know, which is in opposition to the sort of what they call the great man theory, right? Efficient market theory that no price is mis is wrong. That no no the the only the efficient market theory that says the only way. Um, a stock is inefficiently priced as if there's information missing. Right. That and so, certain people, ha and then that certain people can take advantage of. But libertarian, like if a lot of these people are libertarians and maybe, or they're hiding in a libertarian cloak, and there's an argument to be made um, that goes right back to like old liberal with a capital L theology, which is what uh, became libertarian philosophy that would justify changing a bunch of these rules. And then from a practical standpoint, judicially in the last year, there have been rulings that were very clearly uh, uh, changed um, what, who has to profit in order for something to be considered 
insider information, which means that a hedge fund person could get a white paper from a lawyer that absolutely says behavior X is okay. They could rely upon that, whether they secretly believe it or not, take an action and take their chances with the judge, with the SEC, with a prosecutor. It's, um, it's, it's not all Gordon Gecko secretly bribing somebody mm -hmm. to tell them something before the thing happens. And they're all so careful, which is what makes it great, right? Because you want your heroes and villains, your protagonists, antagonists to be as creative, as smart, as engaged in their activities with as much daring as possible. And so this world, because of the way things shift and because, as Dave was saying, they each can have a, a, a belief system that supports considering themselves the hero in their story, that enables you to create, we hope, something compelling to watch because you can root who you root for will say a lot about what you think about the world, not and, just this specific instance. And so, so given that, as you just mentioned, there, there is uh, a specific instance, at least initially, that they're all kind of fighting around. How did you, from the beginning, envision or at least kind of set the seeds so this could last many seasons? Like, how do you kind of plant the seeds so that a whole garden could bloom as opposed to just one season and, and that's it? I, I guess that goes to the characters, you know, once you bonded with these characters and understand what makes them who they are and do what they do, um, you know, these actions have conclusions, but their lives don't end, you know, like they go on to the next thing and it starts to build up again and some of it's connected, but some of it's brand new. So it I mean, just becomes it, like a living organism. Yeah. I, I mean, if you, you do this right, there are lines people say in the pilot that might seem innocuous. But if you do the thing, if the season works and you're engaged, uh, things happen around episode 109, 110, nine and 10, where you could go right back to the pilot and realize, oh, that person was giving uh, us real insight into who he is. And I just saw it played out. I didn't see that coming. I better go comb through this for a bunch of other hints about mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So the great thing about series television is you can lay, you can lay hints in, you can lay character moments in that will sprout to use your analogy later. Sometimes something will happen, something will show up and you'll realize, oh, I'd love that guy to have this in episode 12. We'll put it in episode five. We'll put a hint about it in episode two. And then Would that the really smart right? viewer, right? yeah, sometimes, and then the really smart viewer will be able to to be guessing, leaning, with, uh, and trying to figure it out. And so, you know, and then Matt Weiner always said, and, uh, and David Chase too, I think, uh, So Mad you do Man all and, the uh, ideas, you do so every idea you have in the first season. You just try to, like, don't hold stuff back. Like, if you can do it, bust your world up, do everything you can in the first season. And then if, if you're really locked into these characters, as Dave says you'll, as a creator, um, have the stuff to do for the next season. It's in there. So do you think this is, like, it for you now? Like, assume, I mean, the trailer looks great. Obviously, Showtime is pushing it everywhere. I just, on the way here, I saw a bus with billions on it. So clearly, Showtime is pushing it. Is this, could this be it for you guys? Like, are you going to do this for the rest of your lives? Like, <laughs> 27 seasons of, uh, you know, billions? <laughs> I mean, that might be going a little far i i but are you like ready for it I, the next little while it's hard to um it's hard to really plan to do anything else because you, we're very invested in this and and we hope it keeps going you know you, it's hard to plan uh for for some some other alternative right now right because we'd have to contemplate this thing all being over after the 12 air it'd be too crushing you know we got to keep going we also have these i mean you know, talk a little bit about these actors who are inspired. Yeah, that's another thing. You know, you you write a pilot, you do the best you can, you write these roles you think they're interesting, and if you're fortunate enough, you get this great cast attached. But now these actors go from guys who've done these amazing performances to people you know and start to have affection for. And then if you go to series, they've signed on to do this. That, that's their whole year. That's their this whole chapter of their career. Right, so you're this lives. enormous responsibility to deliver for them on the promise of what started it, you know? 
you can't just phone it in and, and hope it's fine because all these people have invested all their time and their sort of career capital in it. And, and we, how much pushback have you gotten from any of the actors on like, oh, no, I don't think this actor would say this at this point? This is, I mean, no, we've had zero. really good working relationships, you know, collaboration, not arguments. There is a saying. Well, what's in, in the most difficult There point, is a though? saying in TV where they say, you know, uh, the the actor or whatever, the, the showrunner says, first season they work for you, second season your partners, third season you work for them, which I guess is the logic being, um, you, you know, can't do without them. At they some need point. you because they don't know what the show is. The first season, second season, you're shoulder to shoulder. You've done this thing. Third season, they become a big star if the show is a hit. Right? But we have people and who are already power. stars. Yeah, we we have one guy in Jamadi who we've known and worked with for ten years. We produced The Illusionist and uh. have been friends with since then. And you know, it's not like he was an unknown. And Damian Lewis has been a star for a long time too. They you know? they ask really those they are they and Maggie Siff and Malin Ackerman. Um, ask really good questions. We try to give them all the scripts at least a week before each episode, and then they have a couple days to read them and give us comments or ask us questions. Um, sometimes an actor is so dialed into their character that if their character has to go through something emotionally difficult, the actor might be like, I'm not sure I'm not I like, sure I like yeah. I'm comfortable with this. And then afterwards, they always are very happy about they it. They say, oh, I realized, you know, my character was in an uncomfortable spot and so I was living What's an it. uncomfortable spot, though, that they somebody might have felt I don't want to, we're never going <laughs> to okay. reveal like sort of specifics, but uh, about that kind of thing. The, but the, the main thing is we have hugely open lines of communication with these people. We talk to them every day, all day long. And so we're making the show together. We're truly collaborating. Um, and, uh, but they really, like, we could ne really respect what they do, and they are so respectful about what we do. And so that part of it's, I mean, that part of it's just great. Like, what, we write for these people. They can do anything. What was, during the whole process, uh, what was the kind of lowest point during this? Was it kind of waiting for the green light? Was it sort of some writing thing? Was it a shooting thing? Looking at the board, right? Oh, the empty boards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just being in the beginning and, and seeing, you know, the 12 episodes and having some ideas but having huge gaps and knowing that you had to fill it with a lot of really good ideas and just hoping that you could live up to it. Between the pilot and when we opened the writer's room to do the rest of it, there were a couple of days where I, I remember walking around and almost rooting against it because I, <laughs> I knew the that the amount so of work, like... To make it special. To have to really make it great um, and fill... 11 more episodes and really keep the standards and in fact make it better than the pilot because I will say whether somebody watches our pilot and digs it and most people who watch it we've really the responses have been incredible so far and everyone's so enthusiastic but I'm certain the show gets better and better and by the it really finds its voice it becomes its show around the fourth fifth and sixth episode it, it kicks into a whole other gear because we really through this thing of working with the actors and seeing them really in these parts, settling in kind of, um, and realizing the kind of um, the world fully, the show becomes really good. And um, and, you, and that sets you up for heartbreak if it doesn't go well or someone doesn't, but it is for us, like we really found the show uh, and we want to tell it for years and years if we can. And what, when's, uh, so the show's launching January 17th, 10 p.m. on Showtime, billions. Uh, from the trailer, my absolute favorite line, of course, which must be everyone's favorite line, and I'm dying to know who wrote the line, even though you'll never admit it, because I've already asked Brian once. Um, uh, now I'll forget the exact line, but Damon Lewis saying to, I guess, pa Paul Giamatti, you know, what's the point of having fuck you money if you never get to say fuck you? <laughs> that is such a great line. Uh, who wrote that line? We wrote it. We did write the line. <laughs> I can say that uh, we wrote it. It was a line whose time had come. It was ready to be in a screenplay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you, man. Altature, you know I love you, buddy, and I'm so happy to be here and uh, so happy to be your friend. So Thank thanks you. for doing this. And and uh, how how could I have done this podcast better? Do you have any criticisms <laughs> of my podcast? I just want to be as good as I possibly can. You you're, guys are experts at any kind of uh, performance. No, you're great at this. Brian's the podcast actor. You did great, you know? <laughs> no, these are all... You asked questions other people haven't asked. You went deep. 
Um, and uh, I hope there was something of value in it for your that was audience. That incredible. I think the whole oh. arc of show writing you guys went through. Oh, I know. You didn't um, advertise my podcast enough. Oh, which is your favorite. That's a great I mean, point. you say all the time on Twitter yes. that my, it's your favorite podcast. It's the only the moment with Brian Kaufman. It's the only yeah. one I listen to. So the moment by Brian Kaufman, everybody has to listen to it. You're the Where only one. Where can find that? Yeah. Yeah. iTunes.com iTunes. slash the moment. Or Stitcher. But you're the only one who I get really upset because we'll sometimes have the same guests and I'll be like, damn. I should have asked that question. Why is Brian asking that question? Why did he think of that and I didn't? So Now your podcast today has been perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Thanks for having us. Um, I know I'm going to see you soon. And I love my status as uh, the most frequent guest on the show. Excellent. Thanks a lot, nice. you guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye, Levine's book. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. Or the Allison Devon, founder of Teespressa, and there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.